In this lecture, I'm going to talk about antiarrhythmic drugs, so let's get right into it. As you may already know, the pumping action of the heart is controlled by the heart's electrical system. The heart contains specialized cells that are able to create their own electrical impulses and send them to the cardiac muscle, causing it to contract. Now, the cardiac conduction system is made up of five elements. Number one, the sinoatrial node, SA node for short. Number two, the atrioventricular node, AV node for short. Number three, the bundle of His. Number four, the bundle of branches. And number five, the Purkinje fibers. So the normal heart rhythm begins when electrical signals are sent from the SA node. The signal from the SA node causes the atria to contract, pushing blood through the open valves into the ventricles. On the typical electrochydrogram, this is represented by the P wave. Next, electric signal arrives at the AV node and is briefly delayed so that the contracting atria have enough time to pump all the blood into the ventricles. This is represented by the line between the P and the Q wave. At this point, the signal travels through the bundle of His into the bundle of branches. This is represented by the Q wave. And finally, the signal travels through the Purkinje fibers, which causes the ventricles to contract and thus pump blood from the right ventricle into the lungs and from the left ventricle into the rest of the body. This is represented by the R and S wave. The last T wave represents the recovery of the ventricles. Now cardiac cells can be divided into two types. First, contractile cells, which make up most of the walls of the atria and ventricles, and when stimulated, they generate force for contraction of the heart. And the second type, conducting cells, which initiate the electrical impulse that controls those contractions. Now, while contractile fibers can generate an action potential on their own, the conducting fibers are capable of spontaneously initiating an action potential by themselves. They exhibit so-called automaticity. The conducting cells are primarily concentrated in the tissues of the SA node, AV node, bundle of His and Purkinje fibers. Now, normally, SA node reaches threshold potential the fastest, which is why it serves as the natural pacemaker of the heart. When the SA node drives the heart rate, the cells of AV node, bundle of His and Purkinje fibers do not express automaticity or in other words, their spontaneous depolarization is suppressed. However, under certain conditions, when activity of the SA node becomes suppressed or the firing rate of these other conducting tissues becomes faster, one of them can become the new pacemaker of the heart. This is why the AV node, bundle of His and Purkinje fibers are called latent pacemakers. Now, before we move on, Let's take a closer look at the action potential of the pacemaker cells versus the heart muscle cells, as there are some important differences between them. So in the heart, each cardiac cell contains and is surrounded by electrolyte fluids. The main ions responsible for the electrical activity within the heart are sodium, calcium and potassium. When cardiac cells are stimulated by an electrical impulse, their membrane's permeability change and ions move across the membrane, thus generating an action potential. So now, the membrane potential in the pacemaker cells starts at about negative 60 millivolts. When spontaneous flow of sodium, mainly through slow sodium channels and opening of the voltage-gated T-type calcium channels, continues slow depolarization. This is referred to as phase 4. Once threshold potential of about negative 40 millivolt is reached, the voltage-gated L-type calcium channels open, calcium rushes in, and rapidly depolarizes cell to about positive 10 millivolts. This is referred to as phase zero. Finally, the L-type calcium channels close and the voltage-gated potassium channels open, 
which allows potassium ions to escape, thus repolarizing the cell back to negative 60 mV. This is referred to as phase 3. After this, the cycle just repeats itself. Also note that there is no phase 1 or phase 2 in the action potential of the pacemaker cells. Okay, so now let's take a look at the action potential of the cardiac muscle cells. Unlike pacemaker cells, the cardiac muscle cells have resting membrane potential of about negative 90 mV due to the constant outward leak of potassium through the inward rectifier channels. This resting phase is referred to as phase 4. Now, when an action potential is triggered in a neighboring cell, the voltage-gated sodium channels open and sodium rushes in, causing a rapid depolarization to about positive 40 mV. This is referred to as phase 0. At this point, the sodium channels become inactivated and other voltage-gated channels begin to open, mainly potassium channels, which allow potassium to escape, thus bringing about a small dip in membrane potential. This is referred to as phase 1. Now, something that I didn't mention is that during depolarization at phase 0, voltage-gated L-type calcium channels began to open slowly, allowing calcium enter into the cell. So now, with the positive potassium ions leaving and the positive calcium ions steadily coming in, we have this electrically balanced ion exchange which keeps the membrane potential on a plateau. This is referred to as phase 2. Lastly, the plateau phase is followed by a rapid repolarization, referred to as phase 3, which is caused by a gradual inactivation of the calcium channels and continuous outflow of potassium. This brings the membrane potential back to the resting phase 4. So now let's switch gears and let's talk about arrhythmias. So what is arrhythmia? Well, arrhythmia is simply a deviation of heart from a normal rhythm. So normal heart rhythm will have a heart rate of between 60 to 100 beats per minute, with each beat generated from the SA node. Each cardiac impulse will also propagate through normal conduction pathway with normal velocity. Now, arrhythmias are generally classified based on heart rate as bradyarrhythmias, when the rate is below 60 beats per minute, or tachyarrhythmias, when the rate is above 100 beats per minute. However, in order to understand pharmacology of antiarrhythmic drugs, we need to focus on mechanisms of tachyarrhythmias. So, there are three basic mechanisms responsible for the initiation of tachyarrhythmias. First, abnormal automaticity, also referred to as enhanced automaticity. This occurs when the cell membrane becomes abnormally permeable to sodium during phase 4, which results in increase in the slope of phase 4 depolarization. This can cause other cells to accelerate their automaticity and thus generate impulses faster than the SA node. The second mechanism is called triggered activity. Triggered activity involves the abnormal leakage of positive ions into the cardiac cell, leading to this bump on the action potential called after depolarization. These after depolarizations can occur during phase 2, 3 or 4, and if they have sufficient magnitude, they can trigger premature action potentials. Now the third mechanism of tachyarrhythmias is called reentry. Example of this is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, in which an extra or so-called accessory pathway exists between the upper and lower chambers of the heart. So normally, the electrical signal travels from the SA node to AV node to bundle branches, and once it reaches the Purkinje fibers, it stops and waits for another signal from the SA node. Now, when the accessory pathway appears, the signal travels through this pathway from ventricles back to atria, causing them to contract before SA node fires again. 
This creates this abnormal loop of electrical activation circulating through a region of heart tissue causing tachyarrhythmia. Another example of reentry is atrioventricular nodal reentry tachycardia, AVNRT for short. So typically there are two anatomic pathways for carrying signal through the AV node. First pathway is called the fast pathway because it allows fast conduction. However, it has a long refractory period, meaning it recovers slowly. On the other side, the second pathway is called the slow pathway because it only allows slow conduction. And because of that, it has short refractory period, meaning it recovers fast. So now the signal comes down from the SA node and then it splits and travels fast through the fast pathway and slow through the slow pathway. So the fast pathway signal reaches the common pathway on the other end well before the slow pathway signal gets there. From there the fast pathway signal spreads to the ventricles as well as up the slow pathway where it hits the slow signal causing it to terminate. Now if a premature beat occurs at the time when the fast pathway signal is still in the refractory period the signal will travel down the slow pathway. As the slow signal approaches the common pathway, fast pathway comes out of refractory period. So now the slow signal spreads to the ventricles and it also travels up the fast pathway. But let's not forget that the slow pathway has a short refractory period. So by the time the signal reach it reaches the top, the slow pathway is ready to conduct another signal. So what ultimately happens here is that the signal continues to circle around sending fast impulses which result in tachycardia. Now let's move on to discussing the actual antiarrhythmic drugs. So most commonly used classification of antiarrhythmics is the Vaughan Williams classification which groups most antiarrhythmics into four classes based on their dominant mechanism of action. Now let's discuss each of these classes. So first we have class 1 drugs which work mainly by blocking sodium channels in the open or inactivated state. Inhibition of sodium channels decreases the rate of rise of phase 0 depolarization and slows conduction velocity. Class 1 drugs are subdivided into three subclasses according to their effect on the cardiac action potential. First we have class 1A drugs which moderately depress the phase 0 depolarization by blocking fast sodium channels. They also prolong repolarization by blocking some potassium channels. So what we'll see with class 1A agents is prolonged action potential and prolonged effective refractory period. The agents in this class include prokinamide, quinidine, and disoperamide. These agents are used in the treatment of a wide variety of arrhythmias, such as ventricular tachycardias and recurrent atrial fibrillation. Adverse effects include blurred vision, headache, and tinnitus, which may occur with large doses of quinidine, and some anticholinergic effects, which may occur with the use of disoperamide. Secondly, we have class 1b drugs, which have relatively weak effect on the phase 0 depolarization due to minimal blockade of fast sodium channels. However, these agents shorten repolarization by blocking sodium channels that activate during late phase 2 of the action potential. So what we'll see with class 1b agents is shortened duration of action potential and shortened effective refractory period. The agents in this class include lidocaine, and mexilidine, which are mainly used in the treatment of ventricular arrhythmias. When it comes to adverse effects, lidocaine can cause CNS toxicity, including seizures, while mexilidine can cause nausea and vomiting. Now the third and the last subtype that we have is class 1c drugs, which are powerful fast sodium channel blockers, which depress the phase 0 depolarization markedly. They also inhibit the his Purkinje conduction system with a limited effect on repolarization and refractory period. 
The agents in this class include flacainide and propafenone, which are mainly used in the treatment of refractory ventricular arrhythmias. When it comes to adverse effects, the most common ones include dizziness, blurred vision, and nausea. Also, something that I haven't mentioned yet is that one of the risks associated with the class 1 agents, actually all of them, is that they have potential to actually cause arrhythmias themselves. So weighing the risk versus benefit is very important before initiating therapy with these agents. Now let's move on to class 2 antiarrhythmic drugs. So agents in this class act on the beta 1 receptors preventing the action of catecholamines on the heart. So class 2 agents are simply beta blockers. Beta blockers depress sinus node automaticity and slow conduction through the AV node which results in decreased heart rate and decreased contractility. Examples of beta blockers commonly used for arrhythmia are propranolol, metoprolol, atenolol, and esmolol. Now, esmolol, unlike the other beta blockers, is somewhat special in that it's given intravenously in an emergency acute arrhythmias. And the reason for that is that it has fast onset of action and very short half-life, which allows it to be titrated rapidly when necessary. So the bottom line is that beta blockers are good choice for treatment of arrhythmias provoked by increased sympathetic activity. And if you want to learn more about them, check out my other videos about adrenergic receptors and beta blockers. Now let's move on to class 3 antiarrhythmic drugs. So class 3 agents work mainly by blocking the potassium channels that are responsible for the phase 3 repolarization. This leads to increase in duration of action potential and increase in effective refractory period. The agents in this class include amiodarone, dronadarone, sotolol, tofetolite, and abutilite. They are mainly used in treatment of supraventricular and ventricular tachyarrhythmias, as well as atrial fibrillation and flutter. The most widely used drug in this class is amiodarone, which is very effective for the treatment of these aforementioned arrhythmias. Amiodarone has multiple actions, and besides blocking potassium channels, amiodarone also blocks sodium channels, calcium channels, and even some alpha and beta receptors. Unfortunately, amiodarone is also associated with many adverse effects, such as pulmonary fibrosis, blue-gray skin discoloration, neuropathy, hepatotoxicity, corneal microdeposits, and because it contains iodine, amiodarone also can cause thyroid dysfunction, leading to hypo or hyperthyroidism. Lastly, due to its long half-life, amiodarone can linger in many tissues for months after discontinuation of therapy. Now, on the other hand, we have dronadrone, which is derivative of amiodarone. It's less lipophilic and has shorter half-life. It also doesn't contain iodine, so in general, it has better side effect profile. Unfortunately, in many cases, dronadrone doesn't seem to be as as effective as amiodarone. Now, sotolol is a unique drug in this class because it not only has potassium channel blocking activity, but also beta receptor blocking activity. Lastly, dofetolite and ibutilite are the most selective potassium channel blockers in this class. However, they are also most likely to cause arrhythmias themselves, and therefore are typically initiated in the inpatient setting only. Now, let's move on to class 4 antiarrhythmic drugs. So, class 4 agents work by blocking voltage-sensitive calcium channels during depolarization, particularly in the SA and AV nodes, which results in slower conduction in these tissues and reduced contractility of the heart. The agents in this class include verapamil and deltaism, which are the non-dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Unlike dihydropyridines, which act primarily in the periphery causing vasodilation, non-dihydropyridines are much more selective for the myocardium and therefore they show antiarrhythmic actions. Verapamil and deltaism are most commonly used in treatment of supraventricular tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. 
And now, before we end this lecture, I wanted to briefly discuss some other antiarrhythmic agents that do not quite fit into any of the classes that we covered thus far. And these are digoxin, adenosine, and magnesium sulfate. So let's talk about digoxin first. And in order to understand how it works, let's picture a cardiac cell. Under resting conditions, sodium slowly leaks into the cell and potassium leaks out. However, during an action potential, additional sodium enters in along with calcium and additional potassium leaves the cell. So at some point we have this imbalance that has to be restored and this restoration is accomplished by pumps such as sodium potassium ATPase, which transports sodium ions to the outside of the cell and potassium to the inside of the cell. And we also have sodium calcium exchanger, which removes calcium from the cell in exchange for sodium. And as a side note here, keep in mind that sodium calcium exchanger can carry sodium and calcium in both directions. So now what happens when the joxin comes around is that it inhibits sodium potassium pump by binding to the potassium binding site. This results in the increase in intracellular sodium, which then in turn causes the sodium calcium exchanger to pump sodium out and bring more calcium in. Now this increase in intracellular calcium leads to enhanced myocardial contractility. The joxin also stimulates parasympathetic system, which increases activity of the vagus nerve. This results in the slowing of sinus node discharge rate and decreased conduction through the AV node. These actions make digoxin particularly useful for patients with both heart failure and atrial fibrillation. Now let's talk about the second agent, which is adenosine. Unlike all the other agents, adenosine is a naturally occurring nucleoside. It works by stimulating A1 type adenosine receptors on the atrium as well as on the SA node and AV node, which results in decreased automaticity decreased conduction velocity, and prolonged refractory period. Due to its very short duration of action, adenosine has to be administered by IV. Its main indication is an acute supraventricular tachycardia. One of the biggest benefits of adenosine is that it's relatively non-toxic, with the most common side effect being chest pain, flushing, and hypotension. Now finally, Let's talk about our third agent, which is magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate plays an important role in transport of sodium, potassium, and calcium across the cell membranes. Unfortunately, its precise mechanism of action for treating arrhythmias is largely unknown. However, what we know is that magnesium sulfate administered intravenously is very effective for treatment of torsat de point and digoxin-induced arrhythmias. And with that, I wanted to thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed this lecture, and as always, stay tuned for more.